Welcome, my friend Shannon is here with us. So uh, once upon a time, I did an interview with Brian Anderson. And one of the great things about the Father and Together community is that I get to see basically other men working in this space. And Shannon's no stranger to that. So one of the core topics that we can talk about here, well, there's a whole bunch, but I want to open up with is that, uh, Shannon, you've got an opinion about teaching your kids life skills. Yep. So what are the most important life skills you should teach your kids? Um, ooh, that's a good question. So first, thanks for having me on, Jay. I appreciate it very much, man. Um, I love having these conversations anytime we can, you know. Um, as far as life skills, you know, the funny thing about that is I think sometimes we overlook the necessary ones for the ones that are popular at the moment, right? Mm. Um, like taxes, right? Like we should always you know, teach our kids about taxes on sales tax and everything else. And I completely agree with that, but don't forget the smaller, more abstract ideas that are important. Um, I think one of the most important skills we can teach our kids as they grow is failure. It's how to react to mm. failure. Mm. I think, you know, we're such in a win-win society, but those wins only come after years of failures. So I think for our kids to learn that, is essential for their upbringing. And I think how we teach it to them is essential. And it starts with modeling. It stops, starts with them sh seeing your own failures and then how you react to those failures. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a good way to say like, look, I screw up all the time, right? <laughs> like it's a, it's a yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and so when I'm there with my kids and I, I show them, I'm like, all right, this didn't work out for me. And that's okay, that's cool. What I'm gonna teach you now is how we bounce back from that. And some days mm -hmm. it's hard. Some days you don't want to bounce back. Some days you just want to lay in bed and stop or just be done. But that doesn't really help anybody. So I think that's the most important skill we can teach, or at least one of them. There's a bunch, but yeah, that's a big one. That's awesome. I loved it. What What are some of the least important skills to teach? You know, that's a good question too, because I think as parents, sometimes we focus on the wrong things and we, we make this mistake of assuming that our kids are growing up in the same world that we are. And that's just not mm. true. Right. Um, I'm Gen X. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. Right. And that world no longer exists for my kids. And I think the big one now that I've seen over the last years is what do you want to do when you grow up? And, and my daughter's 17. So this is more direct to me. And everyone pushes for them, for teenagers to pick a career choice when they're 15, 16, 17 years old. It's ridiculous. Now, it's not to say that, yes, some kids know they would want to be doctors or engineers or something like that. And you should encourage that and pick the right school for it. But let's also be honest that, uh, that our 17 year olds have no idea what's really involved in the world, what jobs exist. They're going to tell you what jobs are on the TV, doctor, lawyer, firefighter, you know, the things they see in movies. They're not going to tell you that they want to work in textiles because it sounds boring right. and they have no idea what that is. And I, I just went through this with my daughter who loves um, design, right? And she was looking, I was at uh, college with her. We were visiting colleges and we were talking about this and I pulled a random book off the shelf and it was a textile book. And she goes, what is that? And so we went down a whole thing about what it is. So I think asking our kids what they wanted to be when they grow up is great, but trying to channel them into that career path when they're 16 or 17 is ridiculous. I think it's a bad question to ask. I love the... I love the focus implicit in your description, which is highlighting what's possible and showing them and giving them a taste yeah. of what's out there. And yeah. I, I was actually just thinking about, as you were saying that in four to five years, if they go to college or university, the world's yeah. gonna be fundamentally different. You know, the, we're talking right now about the revolution with like ChatGPT, generative AI, all the image, stuff like that. In five years, who the heck knows? You know, I, I, I <laughs> yeah. yeah, I imagine it was similar when uh, social media first came out or the internet first came out, that life was just completely different. Uh, that's a that's a great, um, that's interesting. That's a really great mm -hmm. uh, piece of advice. How would you, so you had an example of showing textiles and, and having your daughter kind of engage yeah. with that. What do you think would be a good solution for other fathers to do to expose their children to more of the world? You know, I think we have to live in it. You know, we have to be aware of it and we have to take our kids along with us. I think uh, segregating ourselves from our children in the real world is not the best of things. They need to see our thoughts on things. They need to see our 
experience with things. We need to bring them with us to the places. Um, one of the things that I do, I, I try to make moments with my kids, these, these little five to 10 moment, 10 minute moments where it's not a lecture, right? But it encourages questions. Like for example, no one, no kid is ever going to ask me about mortgage rates. Who wants to know about mortgage rates, right? <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> it's just a thing. So we refinanced our house a long time ago and I brought my kid with me, all my kids with me to uh, the mortgage office to do all this stuff. And that prompted a question from my daughter who was 15, 16 at the time. And I had a short conversation to at least introduce the idea of what's going on here. Hmm. Um, and that has grown that we do talks about taxes and sales tax and all these other deeper issues that she needs to know as an adult. Um, and I do that a lot with everyday stuff. It's not just, you know, I, I bring up death and taxes because those are always there, right? <laughs> but <laughs> buying a car, you know, uh, going to the mechanic. I, I know a mechanic here. So every time I go, she goes with me. And so is my son. And then if there's an issue, I, I let my kids ask. I say, ask them what this means, even though I may know it, you know, um, because learning to talk and ask and have agency in your life is a big deal. So that's what I try to do. I think that's really, that's key. One thing I just started yeah. to do now with my oldest was give her the card so she can pay. Yeah. And then count moment, out and right? take it. Yeah. Take out the receipt and just say, Hey, this is how this works. This is how you interact with them. Um, all the time now we'll go order food or we'll be at a restaurant or something like that. And she'll just turn to me and tell me what she wants. I'm like, that person's right there. You got to tell yeah. them what you want. <laughs> yeah. Not me. Not me. And yeah. Even with the shopping thing with my daughter and my son, we do the same thing, but we taught them to comparative shop. Like that's a life skill mm -hmm. rather than just going with your dad's money, right? Is now we're like, why are we doing this? And I used to have a deal with my son, especially when he was younger. If he could find me $10 worth of savings at the grocery store, he could buy his toy for 10 bucks. Like it was a game, like a complete game, but he started realizing how to comparative shop. And that's a big day in today's world where everything comes at you and everything's the best and you got to buy this. Um, and that has had dividends. Like nowadays, I'll be honest with you, I give my daughter my card and she just runs like she hates the way I dress. So I'm like, I need shirts. And she just takes my card and we talk and then she's gone. She's out. And I'm like, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. That's such a neat, is. neat thing. One of the skills I'm working on right now is kind of like on the commerce side. So mm -hmm. uh, I just found out from another father that he buys his Halloween candy from his kids. So yeah. just to kind of reduce the sugar intake. And yeah. so I gave her a, a price. We were actually negotiating at it. I said, first it was like fixed fee. And then mom was like, that's not fair. You shouldn't do that. And I was like, okay, well, we're going to do a certain amount per piece of candy and I'll buy you the whole set. I'll buy the whole yeah. set from you. And I said, like, it's either all or nothing uh, just sure. from that perspective. And so that's going to be the first set. And as I was talking with her, I was like, okay, piece number one is you put your time and energy and effort in and you get a, a payment from that. That's like the yeah. standard paycheck thing. Yeah. But then eventually it's going to be, okay, well, if you, I got to figure out if you invest in this product, can we sell it at a, at a, you know, with some margin in it to create, you know, just a, a standard business skill. Yeah. So yeah. it's exactly that. And you're also teaching them negotiation. Another skill that I think we need to teach them way more. And I've taught mm -hmm. my kids that, and it's shocking when they use it on you and you're like, hold up, <laughs> you know, I didn't mean for me, <laughs> you're supposed to do what I tell you. <laughs> I, I love those surprises. I yes. absolutely love it when it's like, oh, I did teach you that. Oh, you, you got me. All right, let's go. And jumping in. It's such yeah. a it's such a delightful moment when they when they're stepping into their own shoes like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, another big topic for you is paternity leave. And I, yeah. I know I have a big uh, some big stuff on here. I, I'd love to hear, you know, let's talk about the high level bullet points of paternity sure. leave, what she would what we should know. So I actually just wrote somewhat of a, an Atlantic article for this one um, that should come out decently soon. But the idea, I think we need to stop calling it paternal leave. It's, it's just, it's just parental leave, right? In the U S it's unpaid for both mothers and fathers. And for men in particular, you know, how are you supposed to take time off with your child when the mother can't work or bring in an income and, you know, maybe, You've got to have money to eat. And if you don't have enough savings in this world, because that's a thing, um, it makes it really hard to take it when it's unpaid. And then we get to the emotional side effect of it that many employers will penalize you for taking it or pressure you not to take it. 
And there's actually research out there that shows men that have taken uh, paternity leave the way they've been interacted with afterwards. Um, that is usually in the negative effect. You give up promotions, your career track doesn't go as far. So if you take six weeks, for example, that kind of very real, real consequences for you. That upsets me, you know, as a father, because you're not the JV team of parenting. You're not the backup. You are the parent, right? Um, your job is there not only to support your wife in her recovery, which is just being a good person, but your job is there to take that kid, take your newborn kid, bond with him, create those lifelong bonds and parent that child. Um, the level of care work that is needed to be done there is essential. And so when, when dads don't get paternity leave or get shamed for not taking it, yeah, that's a very big sore spot with me. I think it's ridiculous. Have you have you read Dr. Um, Anna Matchin's book, uh, Life of the Modern Dad? I have not, but I'm going to now. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic read. Uh, she's kind of one of my, uh, you know, dream guests. I'll, I'll have her on here pretty mm -hmm. soon. I'm going to reach out. Um, but one of the things that she really highlights is, as you were talking about this, the the measurement of what happens when he takes paternity leave or when he takes his parental leave, as you're suggesting, uh, yeah. what can happen to his career. That's actually happened to me. Um, I'll tell my story in just a minute. But then the bonding moment, right? The, the core, if we're thinking about it from a physiological perspective, that bonding chemical is oxytocin. Yeah. Men, right? And so yes. men, men have more vac suppressin receptors. This is something that I, you know, I learned from Adam Lane Smith and, and some other folks out there that uh, we bond more by solving problems with other people. Yes. And so we love doing that. We love getting in there, digging in the dirt and, and coming to a solution together, that fiero of, of accomplishing, uh, slaying the dragon, so to speak. Yes, and, absolutely. And so oxytocin though activates because we, because men actually go through a physiological change. Yes, uh, they do. When she's pregnant. And so, uh, and so we get much more oxytocin flooding through our system, but that is arrested when we don't spend time with our kids. It is. And it's, it's, it's a couple things like that. So uh, another book for you, Dr. Linda Nelson book, uh, wrote a book called myths and lies of fatherhood. She's, it's a fantastic book, but she points that out that we, the men go through physical changes when we care for our children, when the wife gets pregnant. And so do our kids, uh, kids who have a present father have longer telomeres, which is um, the, basically life cycle of the cell, right? And they don't know why mm. that happens yet, but it's a, it's a proven fact. And so the idea that we're just there is not true. Our, our blood pressure goes down, for example, when we hold our child. Um, mm. <coughs> we physically change to get ready to care. And so the myth that we can't care for people is just ridiculous to me. I'm going to say that word a lot today, ridiculous, I think. <laughs> That's good. It's a great word. Uh, um, one of the things I've been, I've thought about for a long time is, how when I was growing up in the 80s, uh, so I'm that one that's between X and millennial, whatever the in-betweeners is called. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm an 81 baby. There so you go. If, that, if that's helpful. Um, I just remember even being young, like really hating the the Marlboro Man, the the Lone Ranger, mm -hmm. the the isolated father or man man figures. And how um, um, even like the, the, I mean, I love Bruce Willis, but you know, even the diehard Bruce Willis where it's like, I'm going to take on the building and, and go all, you yeah. know, do it all by myself. Uh, you know, I, I just always thought that that was such a weird, especially as a, I played sports growing up, such a weird um, image to hold in your brain that like you can do it all yourself. And, mm -hmm. um, and then that's how you overcome and what we should aspire to. I, I just thought uh, that was just a, a weird example to grow up around. It is. And you know, the, the, the problem with a lot of that is you can still be masculine and have a community. You can still be masculine and care for your people. And those are the examples we need to hold up. Uh, my dad was a Vietnam vet, toughest dude I ever knew. So I said my grandfather, World War II vet, toughest guys I ever met. Um, and my dad cared for me a lot when I was growing up. He was primary. He was mostly the primary caregiver, especially in my teenage years. Um, and when I told him I was going to be a stay-at-home dad, um, gave me no flack for it whatsoever. He's like, absolutely. It's the like, best decision you'll ever make, Shannon. Um, and so did my grandfather. And these are very masculine men. They could build you a house. They could, you know, my grandfather would take apart your car in two seconds, right? And they are always very involved fathers on the care level, on the day-to-day -day level. Those are the examples for me that we should, we should hold up more often. And that's a big deal in changing that story of fatherhood, I think. 
And that's where we mm. need to get to. What do you think are the primary stories or primary? Mm -hmm. I think you know what I'm pointing at that yeah. are kind of getting in the way of, the of that. Yeah, the tropes. What's getting in the way of, of having more men embrace fatherhood? Because the data shows 51% of fathers now very strongly and positively identify with that role of fatherhood. Yeah. But they have to do it quietly. They do. And it's, it's a couple of things like, so the, the current trend has been forever. And we call it the at home dad, the, the story or the Homer Simpson story, right? Mm. Everyone loves Homer, right? He's funny. I think he's funny, right? But he is this inept father. And that kind of trope gets carried along over and over and over again, um, where the dad is the idiot in the comedic relief, which is fine, I guess, and then has to be rescued by the mom right who's always the sensible one King that is Queens. yeah that that is what we're fighting against and it's it makes for tremendous comedic opportunities it's it's dramatic and you love dr drama you love co uh, conflict those are all storytelling elements that, that we are drawn to what we hate is a guy who says okay i just showed up and did it every day for 30 years you know there's no drama in that and that's the point of fatherhood right you're just doing a job and men in general are going to brag about doing what they're supposed to be doing Right. It's like, I'm a good dad. I show up every day. I've changed diapers. I do school runs. You know, I'm very competent at what I do. Um, and there's no conflict. And I'll, I'll give you an example about this. About 15 years ago, they asked us to shoot a reality TV show. TLC did. I can actually say this now. So it's been 15 years. Um, and so we had a whole pilot, right, with me and my dad's group. And we had um, cameras follow us around for a couple of days and, you know, things like that. And we got all the way to the president's desk, whoever it was at the time. And they said, we're going to pass because you guys just know what you're doing. There's no conflict. I was like, yeah, that's the point, right? So that story is, is what we have to change. And that comes from a guy named Richard Reeves who writes a book called A Boys and Men. He's a fellow at the Brooklyn. Yeah, he's a great guy. And I asked him the same He actually question. left. I, I just want to, I want to add this. Uh -huh. It was a couple months ago. Um, he actually left Brookings. He founded yeah. as the president of the, uh, oh, it's like Men's Health and Research or something like that. I forget. It's American it. Institute on Boys and Men. <laughs> That's it is. what it is. And there it is. I asked him the same question, and he says, We have to change the story of fatherhood. And this is how we do it by getting good examples out there that are still entertaining, that are still have all the elements that you want, but are good stories. And that's the harder point. Do you think it's more important to change? More important to say, don't worry, we're going to be punchy. Is it more important to change the fatherhood role and trope? Or is it more important to change the man role and trope? You know, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of both. For me, it's hard. I don't separate myself from a father and a man. It's the same guy, right? Sure. And we I wouldn't. Think, and so I'm just to kind of push on that, right? We wouldn't yeah. as we're yeah. in it. Cause like we, we've embraced yes. that, but you know, you have, you said you have a younger son. Yeah. So, right. He's going to hit man before he hits father. Yes. Hopefully. Well, he's, he's 16. So we're there. We're doing all the right. things. I, I had to have some, those big dad conversations with him. I think we need to change it all. Right. Hmm. Um, and we need to be connected with each other. I think that's where we're failing a lot. I think we, there are, like Dr. Reese points out, there's all these old institutions uh, that are no longer there. Um, and not for a bad way, you know, that just time moves on. So we don't have that kind of connection with each other and those examples as we used to. And I think if we get back to those, we can change both. We can change how, what it used to be a man and what it used to be a father. And I've always told my son, I said, no one gets to comment on your masculinity. It's personal. What you decide is a man is what is a man. It's just plain and simple. You know, because no one has a definition. Everyone has this whole weird thing of alpha male and beta male and definitions change. And it's just, it's yeah. just stupid. It's all from the, that's all from the dating, the dating market of teaching them how to be more charismatic. And it's, it's completely meaningless. Like what it is. the, the core things, I, I think it really, when we're, when we're talking about this, right, there's, we're talking about identity and identity is defined by your community, people around you. Yeah. And so I think like if there were any, if there was anything that I would say that is masculinity, I would just say it's reliability. I it's the so. one, you know, when you, when I, when I think about it, if I, if I go way back to hunting the mammoths and killing the things and defending the cave and, and caring and, you know, and, and doing all that kind of jazz, it's like reliability. And that's the one yeah. thing that really different differentiated those that survived and those that didn't. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of built in. 
Um, I, I really think you're going to love this, this book from uh, Dr. Anna Manchin and, and any feel good father listening. I think you're going to love it as well. It really, so that the big thing for me that it defined and it opens with a story, mm-hmm. right? The, re- the reason why we exist as a species is because we are nominal in the animal kingdom in that we are the only one where both parents hang around. And so yeah. the reason why we've evolved in the way that we have, why we have the brains that we have, why we have the intelligence that we have, why we've, you know, why we're able to speak through these electrical things here, you know, and invent this, yeah. whereas like, you know, other, other prime species on the planet haven't is because, is because of the uh, gestation period, because of uh, the skill passing from father to offspring, the mm-hmm. whole thing. And, and that doesn't really happen anywhere else mm-hmm. in the animal kingdom. No. Mm-mm. So, um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I think I'm not sure that we, we address that too much about man versus fatherhood. Let's, let's go back to that, that point. You know, the, the man versus fatherhood, I think you have to start with good men to get good fathers. Like, mm. I think fatherhood can be a catalyst to maybe transform you. And I hope it is, but I think you got to have the bare bones in place before you even start, you know, and that means teaching our sons that responsibility early on. I think, mm. In today's world, and I've written about this before, what pushes a man to the limit, right? What pushes him to the to the incel or to the hateful, right? And there's a lot of different reasons. And I think some of it's competition that nowadays it seems that we can't just win, that we have to, if I win, you have to lose. And not just yes. lose, but you have to be dominated and humiliated. Mm-hmm. And I think we see that in our politics, we see that in our business, we see that in our day-to-day world, and that's the example that's gotten out there. And I think that makes me ask the question, well, what if you lose that one time and you don't come back from it? What road does that go down there? Or what if you lose mm-hmm. a lot in dating and jobs and things like that? Does that cause you to hate the world? I think competition, unhealthy competition is some of that way. And I think being unable to deal with failures and not teaching that skill is some of that as well. I think the lack of community around most men and the isolation that we feel, I think that's certainly a contributing factor. I think there's about 20 different things that we need to to, to kind of go down to repair or to make us better men. Um, Top three, top three, top three, uh, mentorship and community. I think that's number one, right? Um, Self-confidence. And that's a learned skill. Self-confidence is a learned skill. It's very hard to teach too. Um, That's number two. Um, Number three, I will say it again, how to deal with failure. I think those three things are pretty important into creating men that, that want to add, add to the world rather than take away from it, right? We want to build something better. We want to we want to improve what we have, not tear down what we have. And I think that's mm-hmm. a, an important distinction to make. So how do we, um, this is really good because I think mm-hmm. these are things that we discussed it, that we talked about, yeah. talking about today. So uh, let's, uh, isolation, I think is fairly, I think it's fairly well documented. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of really negative consequences for men when it comes to isolation. Sure. Um, but I'd love to just kind of hang out in solution world for a bit. Let's talk about mentorship and community. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to hear your take on, I guess the first question would be, and let's just hang out in mentorship, but we'll do community mm-hmm. second, right? Let's talk about mentorship. What does it look like and how do you get it? You know, that's the hard one, right? That's the big question is how do we get that mentorship and where does it even exist anymore for men? You know, it used to come from maybe your own father, things like that. But for and, uh, divorce rates have gone up or men's role within the families has been ridiculed or pushed past where they're not as connected to their families as much. There's the war on drugs that have ridiculous minimums for marijuana. And then all of a sudden you're tearing apart more families and you have systemic poverty mm-hmm. You have, it's different between class and races. So there are tons of reasons for it that men feel isolated. And those institutions, like I said, are not as strong as they used to be. And this is not a bad thing for me. You know, when the patriarchy changes, uh, we need to evolve with it. We don't need to take away the rights of a woman, for example, to make ourselves better. That's the mistake, right? Um, Society is better. Let's just just hit this for a moment. Society is better for more equanimity in it. Society is better for more opportunity across the board. Yes. Uh, you know, I talk about traditional marriage wasn't hurt by gay, gay marriage. 
Men no. weren't hurt by women joining the workforce. No. We're more than a hundred years into this world, post World War One, when they yeah. left the factories and, be, and got their own apartments. Uh, and by that I mean women. When women did that, they worked in the yes. factories while the men were away. Then they got their own apartments, and that kind of started the modern, the whole modern thing. Nobody is hurt by other people having more opportunity, and nobody's arguing for that. And if you're in a zero sum world, you're playing the wrong game. You absolutely are. And I think what we need to realize is two things: that one, as a man, I have more choices than I did in the past. I can be seen as more than just a paycheck. Now, as a stay-at-home dad, that's pretty important. And I wouldn't have done what I've done if things didn't change. I wouldn't be able to, right? Um, I think that's an important distinction to make. And I think the second distinction to make is that this is not a problem for women to solve. It's a problem for us to solve and for them to acknowledge. And, you know, when we talk about male lonely or loneliness and things like that and that mentorship, I don't mean dating or a wife. You can be lonely within a marriage, right? You can be lonely within a relationship. I'm talking about real human connection across multiple people. Um, and some of those need to be men, right? You need men around you, uh, gay, straight, whatever. It really doesn't matter that just understand you as, a, as what you're going through. So let's get to solutions. How do we find that? How do we repair that, right? That's the hard thing. Mm. I think podcasts like this, I think the writing I do, um, the places that I always tell dads is uh, city dads groups. They run dad groups with 41 cities. Um, and no one cares if you're stay at home dad or not. I mean, yeah, we have play groups. But we also have dads night outs. And those are places where you can go and ask real questions and get beyond the surface level conversations that men have and make a real connection. And that was a piece of advice I got from a uh, Movember, the organization Movember that, that leads uh, yep. men's mental health. And I talked to them. Yep. It's like, we got to get beyond those surface level conversations and that's how we do it. But there's, they're starting to pop up everywhere. These, these fatherhood communities um, where there's no pressure. It's just, we're just going to hang out. Right. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you're going to ask questions about your car and sometimes you're going to ask questions about periods. You know, I need to know these things. Um, for example, my wife, uh, when she was breastfeeding, she had cracked nipples and I didn't know what to do with that. I never heard a thing like that. It's not a question I can really ask anybody else because it seems creepy as hell. Right. I, mm. but my wife is hurting. My, my daughter was hurting. I need to know people ask. And I was with a dad's group. And I asked and I got help and they're like, okay, get this bomb, get this shield. You're good to go. And I've been with the same dad's group for 15, 16 years now. And we do this mm -hmm. literally all the time from those ordinary conversations, what's going on in our life to what do I do now from potty training to picking a college, same thing. And that mm -hmm. is, you, if, if you can find that mentorship, if you can find those people, it makes a huge difference in your life. So that's one think solution. I think everything there is fantastic. And those are really the benefits. And yeah. the one thing that uh, way back in college, when I used to help men with their confidence, stuff like that, the one thing that I would say is that <clears throat> you have to make the first step. Yes. Nobody's going to make it for you. Nope. And, um, and all you have to do, and, and what I always used to say is, if you want to build your confidence, you got to find a group. You have to have a, uh, what I call it, you have, to, you have to find your cheers. What's the room that you can go into where everybody knows your name? Yep. And I said, it didn't really matter what it was, but it should be something you enjoy. And whether yes. that's just a, a social group, what you're doing, if it's, you know, I, I used to do a lot of uh, dancing and art, right? And so I would go to the, I was very well known around some of the local galleries and a lot of the local artists. Mm -hmm. I also used to teach and I danced for about seven years. And those are really healthy, great communities for me. Yeah. Um, but really it's just whatever it is. And the only thing that I would say is try and find something where liquor isn't the primary reason why you're meeting. Try yes. and not just be, I'm going to go to the game, try and do that. It's, it's better for you to have pizza and poker while watching football on Sundays with a consistent yes. group of dudes than it is to just have a local bar that you go to, to connect. And I, I think agree. they're just different kind of areas. So the, the first thing is, you know, have a hobby and then find other people that like that hobby. Yeah. And um, if you don't know how to do that, just freaking look up Reddit on whatever it is that hobby is and yes. you'll find a local group. So and you'll find their passion, man. Once they find that, maybe it's just, I'm a people person. I could talk about people's passions all day long and sure. that's, they'd love to share it, to show up, man. Take that. Yeah. You're right. Take the first step. So, so that's the, the mentorship side. And I think yeah. just to kind of clarify, that means having a place like being mentored and mentoring is, is basically the ability that you can take the skills and knowledge you have and transfer that to somebody else. Yeah. And then somebody can do that to you. Yes. Right. So, so that's going to be that part. So the second part of that question was community. And yeah. I think that there's, you know, I, I think on the pod, I've talked a lot about how to found a community and be the, the head of a community. 
And I'm, and I'm kind of curious what your take would be, not on that question, but how to be a good member of a community. You know, it's consistency for me, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to show up in person because lives are busy and I know, but you have to interact. You have to engage if you want to be part of that community and, and lead that community. That's the biggest part. Um, and that's what you have to do on a daily basis, right? And sometimes that can be hard, especially if you join too many. That's been mm. my deal. I was like, all right, I need to pull back a little bit. Um, but engagement and consistency. If you're, if you're joining a community or you're leading a community, those are two things you got to have. And that comes from running a dad's group for 15 years to the other things that I've done. Um, if you can do that, then you're okay. Then you'll be all right. Other guys will step up. Love it. I think um, one thing as well that I want to add here is that there's a section with one of my podcast interviews, Dr. Jenny Prohaska. It talks about uh, the variety of different groups that you're a part of leads mm -hmm. to better mental health. Because yes. if, if you think of your day-to-day -to, -day to being like an echogram, and so I'm kind of doing up and down in, I'm pantomiming this for those listening. Yeah. Um, if you think of your ups and downs, your emotional state is like highs and lows and stuff like that, it goes like this. The more groups that you have, mm -hmm. the more stable that echogram is going to look as far as your mental state. And that's true. One, I heard that 15 years ago about parenting. How do you stay away from the highs and lows and get to that stable moment? And it's great advice. Absolutely. Awesome. Our, our next thing was self-confidence. And so this is something that I think is, um, this is interesting because I, when I think of a lot of broken homes, right, a lot of kids, uh, this one broke my heart when it, when it hit, like when you're in a broken house, like your parents are divorced, most kids take that on. They think it's something that they did. Yes. And so from a foundational level, uh, a lot of kids, a lot of adults today have this, uh, this identity of they're the ones that broke apart their family. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's really, I'm really curious to see like with the self-confidence, I think number one, um, again, I think we could have a brief discussion about how to do that for your kids. Yeah. But then I also think like, okay, well, if you're an adult, if you're part of the two thirds of adults that have issues, right. How do you build more self-confidence? You know, it's such a hard thing because it's, it's better shown than taught. Right. Um, mm. I think with younger kids, this goes back to failure and this is why we teach them how to fail. Um, and there's been studies about this. Men are generally more self-confident uh, because we've played sports or we've been competitive. And that's the positive side of kind of competition. So we've been beaten, right? And mm -hmm. we've learned how to get back from that. And so yeah. I kind of taught my kids. That's why they, that's why your kids need to see you fail is so they can see how to, do, to come back from it. And I use this on my kids. It's, it's like, okay, we screwed that up. And, but we screwed up before. So this time we're great. And that self-confidence comes through. But it's a constant everyday kind of fight to have or at least a lesson to learn. Um, and so I think that's how we f we do it on the individual base when they're young kids. As adults, I think it's much harder because we've had life kick us in the teeth by then, right? <laughs> we, life is right. difficult. We've had massive failures. We've had heartbreak. We've had those things. And so you can't really say you know, take one for the gipper. Cause I hate the goddamn advice. I hate it so much. Right. It's like, mm. man up. I hate that advice as well. So the question is, how do we, how do we teach that self-confidence? I don't think you can. I think you can model it and show it and encourage it. That's why you need a community. That's why you need your cheerleaders, right. To push you to the next level of, of what you can be. Right. And if you have, and I've written about this, the power of belief, and not your belief, but the belief that someone has in you is extraordinary. And that's why you need the community. That's where you can get a lot of self-confidence. Now, for my introverts out there, I know this is terrifying you. <laughs> and I totally get that, right? It doesn't have to be in person. It doesn't have to be a lot of things. It can be over email, it can be over text, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. Get yourself a cheerleader. I have a good friend named Jen Mann. She's a writer. And she says, you need a hype man. And that's what you need. And I'm mm -hmm. lucky. I have the same four dads I've been with 15 years. They're all my hype men. And now they keep mm -hmm. me humble too, right? It's, it's, it's the people that I go to when I know I need to be set straight. And I think that is how we fix it in men. I'm happy that you brought up the accountability piece because I yeah. love the hype man side. But I think also somebody that can call you into being and saying, you kind of messed that up. You should yeah. do better oh, next yeah. time. Or go fix it. <laughs> I think, yes. I think for men in particular, right? Um, what I love about accountability from, man, we'll just talk about how men receive that, is that when somebody says, hey, 
you know, you kind of mess that up. You can do better. They're doing that same thing. They're yeah. saying, I see more greatness in you than you see in yourself. So yes. why don't you go fix that thing? You know, the great yeah. thing about like when this, when this comes out, right. I will have my four dads are going to listen to it without me telling them. And then we're going to sit down and they're going to tell me what I can do better. And it's always constructive oh, criticism, nice. but with humor, like, Oh, Shannon, you tell that story too much. Knock it off, man. It's like, I have a sound guy. He's going to be like, you're, you're playing with your pen too much, dude. Stop it. So they keep you humble, mm. but they keep you straight. And so I, I take it in the spirit it's given and it, it does. It makes me a better person and a better writer, a better father. Uh, uh, let me pick it back on that. And uh -huh. uh, if you do get that and they do have some feedback for me, send it my way. <laughs> oh, they will. <laughs> they will. They're good guys. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Love it. And we talked a little bit about failure and teaching, teaching failure and failing ourselves. Yeah. I think this is, I, I completely agree. I absolutely think it's a, a wonderful skill to lose because it, it has that resiliency and persistence. But when you brought up sports, what that reminded me is it's not so much failure, that's kind of losing. Yeah. And what do you think about teaching people how to lose? It's, all, again, a hard skill to teach, right? When you take a loss and you're going to have a lot of them, right? You're going to have a lot of losses in your life because it's life and it's normal. And honestly, it's boring to win all the time. That... Again, it comes back to what am I going to do to improve? You know, where am I going to take my next step? Um, I internalize some of those things to figure out what I could do to make a better outcome. And I've always done that since I was a teenager, right? From football and everything else. And even when I'm competitive now, whether it's softball or, or chess, you know, I play a lot of chess and I'm like, what did I do? You know, and so learning to fix those things and let my kids see me fix those things. Um, that's the response I want them to have, right? We can complain about things when you say, and all that and that. yeah. When you say fix those things, uh -huh. you're it. It, it sounds like you're pointing at there's a skill gap, yes. there's a knowledge gap between what you needed to succeed or win and yes. how you lost. Yes. Right. So, so you're talking about fixing a skill. Fixing a skill, and it either comes through practice or, like you said, knowledge, depending on what you're doing. And most often, it's it's a combination of both, right? And that skill could be just you're trying something new, like my son's in volleyball, right? And overhand serves, right? They're killer when you can get them, but he's 10. So, you know, it doesn't always happen. So we practice that skill set a lot, but it comes with the knowledge of knowing how to do it and then repeating that knowledge over and over so you have the muscle memory to do it. Um, and even if we extrapolate that to any part of life, it's the same thing. Get the knowledge, practice the skill, get the muscle memory, um, get those things done and you can get better. You're never going to be the best in the world because there's no such thing. There's always someone better, right? But you can be good and you can be confident with it. Uh, another former guest, Brett, talked about Jonathan Livingston Seagull. There is no cap. Yeah. There's no cap. There's no cap to skill. Nope. And that's, um, I forget who it was. Was it Warren Buffett? I think that said that. I think Warren Buffett said that, that there's, there's no end point. There's no. no end to human, to human capability. There's no end to potential. Um, it is literally infinite. And just a matter of how far along that line you're going to get. Yep. That's truly Absolutely. it. It's a lifelong learning. That's what I tell my kids. You got to have a love mm -hmm. of learning no matter what it is. Just anything. It doesn't matter. Right. It'll make you a better. Got person. it. And then final, since we did uh, how to teach losing, uh -huh. I think another skill we need to teach is how to, how to teach winning. Yes. And this is a, this is a sore point with me. Cause again, we teach women winning now as domination and humiliation that I've got to take everything from you. And it's that old, that movie, there might be, there will be blood, right? I, I take your milkshake. I drink it all up. The whole purpose of that is I don't have to win. You have to lose and you have to be humiliated to do it. And I think that's the mistake that sets us down some very dangerous paths um, that makes us more closed off as individuals. And I won't just say men, I'll say individuals, you know, hmm. uh, we get blindsided where we sacrifice everything to get the next win. Yeah, I mean, it almost sounds like you're saying, it almost sounds like you're saying like being a healthy adult means not listening to Hollywood's messages. There's a lot of it, you know, it is, it's very interesting to see, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I think as a, I think as a, a former game designer, you know, I think about what game are you playing? Yes. And I, right. Are you playing the the good life, the relationship, the community, the everybody winning, the contributive role, or are you yes. playing the dominating, isolating, king of the hill, yes, uh, standard standard video game role? Yes. And um, you know, it's it's really funny. Back in the day, there was a Superman game, mm -hmm. 
And it was really, it was really interesting because at that time, there, he didn't really have any weaknesses at, in the canon. Like Superman's very different today. But for the video game, it was like, well, I mean, how do you make a game where the dude can't lose? Yeah. Right. Like, where's and, the challenge? And one of the things, yeah, where's the challenge? And one of the things that they did was they made it an environmental was a lose state so that the city could gradually uh-huh. lose effectively. So, uh, you know, time challenges, uh, corruption, that kind of jazz. And I think, and I love the idea of um, the good guy that it being a, the spinning plate thing. Yeah. You know, we see all this positive contribution, stuff like that. And there's always going to be challenges, but I think, I think that the fact that there's always going to be challenges, another way to look at that, there's always opportunities to improve and to make things better. I think so 100%, you know, and you got to seek out those challenges. I don't think, for me at least, I think becoming complacent with who I am and say, okay, this is good enough for me right now is not something that motivates me for tomorrow, you know? And it doesn't have to be every aspect of my life. It just has to be this thing today, you know? Um, whether I say, all right, to improve myself, I'm going to read more of these types of books or... Um, if I want to prove my chess, I'm actually going to pay attention a little bit more. You know, um, if I want to be a better painter, I'm going to paint more. It's anything like that. It doesn't have to be professionally. And I think that's, we get, we get harnessed on professionally. It's like, okay, it can only be professionally that we want to improve ourselves. Like now there's a whole world out there, man. Don't box yourself in. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, my friend, Shannon, if you're a good father, want to get a hold of you and uh, learn more about you. Where sure. can they go? Uh, you can always find me on social media, Shannon Carpenter, author, or Hossman at home. Um, I run a I run a uh, a column on the Good Men Project called the Hossman at Home. It talks about men's issues. That I'm a humor writer primarily, but I, I mix in these serious talk topics with humor because I think that's how you reach men. It's mm-hmm. humor serves as our shield when we when we need it. Um, and also my website, Shannon Car- or CarpenterAuthor.com. And then as always, if you want to learn more, you can go buy my book, The Ultimate Stay-at-Home Dad. It teaches you how to be a dad on a skill level, not as a, a platitude, but as an actual do these things, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think so. that's super great. Uh, Shannon Carpenter, everybody. Thank you very much, man.